HR is, uh, is responsible for, uh, or at least has considerable influence and impact on how people are managed. And there are a number of ways in which HR has an impact on, um, on trust, and we're going to be looking at those uh, today. So, HR in particular looks at the people of an organisation and the relationships between colleagues, the relationships between bosses and with employees. And that gives it significant potential to shape the trust within those relationships, to shape both the expectations that employees have about their own trustworthiness and about their own trust amongst colleagues, but also what the organisation's expectations are of the employees and the employees' expectations of their employer and the kinds of behaviours that are going to be tolerated. HR, the HR function, or HRM as the set of policies and practices, promotes trust and trustworthiness by incentivising or constraining people to behave in certain ways. So how you are incentivised, how you are rewarded, what gets rewarded and what gets punished, to a large degree comes from, for example, compensation, but also the targets and the performance management appraisal systems that exist. And so HR has a significant impact on, how, on trust and trustworthiness. Another way in which it also has an impact is that HR and HRM sends out the signals and the cues as to their employer's trustworthiness. If you think about the HRM that applies to yourself, the way in which you were recruited, selected, the way in which you were onboarded, trained, career progression, pay, etc., etc., employee voice, all of those are really, they are sending out signals about the employer, about the employer's competence, the employer's motives, the employer's honesty and fairness and predictability. The third way in which HR and HRM contributes to trust is that it helps to shape what's called, what we call the psychological contract. Okay? Each of you, you have a set of expectations about what you believe you expect from your employer, the duties and the obligations that your employer has toward you and that you have toward your employer. That we call the psychological contract. If that psychological contract is met, in other words, your expectations are fulfilled and the employer's expectations are fulfilled, great. We have a trusting relationship where trust can break down is that the one party to that psychological contract, they have had their expectations undermined or potentially violated and the consequences that that has on distrust. Remember that in the definitions that we were looking at about trust, trust is a willingness to rely on another party, such as your colleagues or your employer, on the basis of confident, positive expectations. So the psychological contract is all about those mutual expectations. And HRM also contributes to what we call person-organisation fit, the extent to which each individual employee feels comfortable working within that organisation, and of course the organisation feels comfortable continuing to employ that, employee, uh, that in particular person, and the extent to which people have a person job fit as well, that they are the right person in the right position. So, just as an essential reminder of how it works, any managerial intervention, we've been looking at this, whether it's managerial interventions in the form of leadership that Anil's looked at, managerial intervention in the form of compliance that John has looked at and that Mario has looked at, personal conduct, decision or new policies. All of these create the decisions, the trust beliefs, the decisions and behaviours that we've been talking about, which in turn, if we trust people, we are, as Anil pointed out, we have more engagement and we have commitment. If you don't trust people, you tend not to be engaged, you tend to be disengaged. That has a consequence, we know, for internal performance within the organisation and then for employees' well-being. So if we think about HRM, if we think about HRM, it's what managers do and how HRM is conceived, de designed and implemented is going to shape employees' trust beliefs, their attitudes and their decisions and their behaviours. The HRM interventions impact on how much people trust, their em trust each other at work, trust their boss, trust their employer, with the knock-on effect that it would have. The idea is that we're going to have a mutually beneficial reciprocal relationship. So, recruitment and selection on the employee value proposition. In other words, the branding 
of the organization as a place to work. The level, what, the pay that you get in terms of your basic pay, but also your um, bonuses, performance management, the appraisal systems, the training, work-life balance, the extent to which employees are involved in decision-making, which varies dramatically around the world, and also the treatment of downsizing that Anil has done in terms of some of his research. All of that, these are HRM interventions that have an effect. They shape the beliefs, they motivate the trust behaviours, and these trust behaviours in turn have an impact on the positive kind of behaviours that we're looking for, but potentially the dysfunctional behaviours that can exist inside an organisation. Companies that are good to work for and companies where people enjoy working, they tend to reinforce the level of trust. Yeah? A company that is good to work for, people enjoy working for it. It's a trustworthy company. A company that's, uh, that, it, uh, that it's an enjoyable place to work tends to reinforce the trust, which in turn should hopefully modify some of the HRM interventions when there is a gap. Yeah? In other words, it's a very similar, similar model to each of the presentations that we've had before. Okay? But what you do in terms of the design of the policy and the, and the implementation of the policy is going to have an impact on trust. So we can have a look at it. One of the ways in which you can do it is through an audit of the HR policies. And I'm going to be asking you in a short while to think about one of these particular HR policies and the extent to which it has an impact on your trust. So to what extent is the design and the implementation of a given HR policy either demonstrating the attributes of trustworthiness from the employer or is encouraging the attributes of trustworthiness in staff. The way in which people are selected, for example, the way and who becomes the leaders and the heroes of an organization, but in, even well into the entry of, uh, uh, into the entry of the organization. Training managers in trust building and trust repair. So Anil, Bob and myself, we do training and where we explain how trust is built what trust is, and then part of the things that we can encourage companies to do is to, well, let's have a look at our HR policies and to see, well, have we got some dysfunctional, some dysfunctional causes that are undermining trust and trustworthiness? The way in which people are incentivized to be trustworthy or potentially not, and to be trustworthy to whom? I think, John, uh, I imagine at IBM it will be very interesting to find out about the compensation and benefits that exist and what is rewarded in, in terms of the take-home salary that you have. Many of the banks, for example, there were plenty of perverse incentives and it's one of the contributors to the global financial crisis. What signals and incentives do our job designs, the targets and the rewards send about trust and trustworthiness and also the volume and the coherence of the signals if you're sending out certain signals that are mutually incompatible with each other. We want you to be an ethical, we have an ethical culture here. Yeah, well, we pride ourselves on our values, but just as long as you hit the targets, we'll turn a blind eye. Okay? You get the idea. <clears throat> so the first thing I'd like you to do is the design and implementation of an HR policy. What I first of all I think I'd like us to do is I think I want you to speak to some new people. Okay? So what I'm going to ask you to do, I'm going to ask uh, Therese and Alex to swap. I'm going to ask Gary and Mario, if that's... Well, uh, sorry, Gary and Maria to swap, okay? Just to swap over the room. Can I also ask uh, Melissa and Joseph to swap, okay? Just to move around, so you're going to be talking to some brand new people, okay? About... <coughs> yeah, if you sit over where Gary is, yeah? Lauren, as well, if you're curious, if you want to move around, then please, by all means, do. Fundamentally, just to, get, to speak to some different people. What I'd like you to do, what I'd like you to do is now, is to, is to have a think about your own job, okay? Have a think about your own job or about an employer that you know, and in particular, a policy that you would know quite a lot about, okay? So, for example, how, you, how people are recruited and selected to join your organization, the induction that people receive, perhaps. The level of training that you receive. What, what are you trained in and why and how? Or you might want to focus on your, on your salary and your bonuses. Okay? What is it that is being incentivized? What is it? And what, what is it telling you about interest alignment, similarities with the organization, 
What are the indicators of, for example, ability within your organization? What are the prized competencies? And which ones are the ones that are somewhat marginalized or somewhat neglected? Benevolence, if it's present, for whom? Yeah? What, when, when you think about these policies, if you're thinking about the incentivization and the performance management of your job, well, to what extent are you being incentivized to be benevolent? And it's toward whom? You see what I mean? In other words, what motives are being fostered by these particular policies? In terms of internal communications, what is it that you receive in terms of the messaging about the trustworthiness of the organization, or more importantly, your own trustworthiness as an employee? 